Where we're going to kick off, we break today into two parts. So the first part of today, we're going to take a look at what we call a CEO life audit. Today is all about running your life like a business. We use the same principles. Come in, bro. The same principles that make a business successful to build a successful life. Now, a couple of years ago, end of 2017, I had a business which I sold. Uh, it was great. I'd owned it for nine years prior. And before I sold it, um, everything got audited. Marketing got audited. Sales got audited. Uh, delivery and systems got audited, the ops and admin, the finance, the team, you know, all the structures we had in place. If you were going to buy a house, you'd do the same thing. You'd send someone through the property to take a look. The big challenge is we don't do this with our life. Most of the time that people do a CEO life audit or take a hard look at their life, and today, the, you know, the questions are for you. Uh, most of the times that people do this is either A, after a really big breakup, um, where you go like, fuck, what's happened here? Um, for some people, New Year's. But again, the stat is that 92% of people don't go on to achieve their goals after New Year's because it's just hype. And then number three that we've seen in Mantastic is just a significant birthday. I've watched people turn, you know, 35, 40, 45, 50 and go, well, hey, you know, this is around the corner. This is what I want to do. So uh, I'm a big fan of doing what we're about to do regularly and consistently. So first half of today is a life audit. The second half is a system, which is probably why you're here. So what I'll get you to do, Legends, is I'll get you to flick to the beginning of the workbook uh, where it says the Mantastic CEO Life Audit and, and a five. And I just want you to rate yourself as to where you're at. You don't have to share the answer with me. It's just for you to go through as we go through it. So typically a 10 is rockstar, kicking ass, absolutely awesome. What we call Joff in our language, just on fucking fire. Uh, and a one is the poorer side of five is like somewhere in the middle. So the first area we're going to take a look at is mindset. And I think mindset's a really important area as a guy. What I've found for me personally is that when my mindset is on point and when I'm eating well, when I'm training well, when I'm sleeping well, when my head uh, or my mental fitness is in a good place, typically it's a force multiplier to every other area of my life. So business goes better. I'm better with money. All the key relationships that I have in my life go better. Uh, I, train, I train way better. And just typically everything is just heaps easier. I also find that when I'm in a mindset of pushing myself, growing myself, um, not procrastinating, just doing the next thing that I need to do and being busy on mission, um, that's the best space for me. So that's kind of like the 10 side of mindset. It means you're out there, you're having a go, you've got a growth mindset, you're pushing yourself, um, and your head's generally in a good place. What a one looks like is one's more the side of procrastination. So one looks like Maybe you're uh, dwelling on things. Maybe you know, there's things that you know you should be doing that you're not doing. If you look at a negative mindset, generally it works as a negative force multiplier. So sometimes what happens in that phase is uh, caffeine, alcohol, uh, bad, few, uh, bad food gets abused, start like not eating correctly. Um, and then you find that because of that, when your head goes into a bad place, and again, it can come from the pressure and the stress of life and everything that happens, works as a ne negative force multiplier. Business kind of dwindles down. Uh, make poorer decisions with money, poorer decisions around training and nutrition and the way that you eat, um, poor, or kind of like a shorter fuse in, in relationships. In other words, you, you tell people to get stuffed a little bit easier and you kind of get known as a, a Mr. Angry. On the poorer side of mindset as well, we've got kind of overthinking things, procrastinating, and, and in our language, just not pulling the fucking trigger, not doing the thing that you need to do. So that's a one. A five is somewhere in between. The next we've got on the list is business. Now, this is an interesting one. Business, I view everyone as a business owner. So even if you're in a career at the moment, I think that you should view yourself um, with a BO mindset as opposed to an NBO mindset. An MBO mindset is a non-business owner mindset. And that's there, just give me my money, I'm out the door, I work Monday to Friday, you know, I want more than I'm currently got, uh, but that kind of mentality won't really grow you. So I like everyone to view themselves as a business. If you work for someone else and you want to get promoted, we've had some people sit in these sessions, get 20, 30, $40,000 promotions inside of 12 to 18 months. You need to view yourself as a business owner, more as an entrepreneur, and take a look at how you can add value because the fastest way to earn more money, fastest way to the bottom is to do nothing, fastest way to earn more money uh, is to provide more value. So from a business point of view, I kind of look at this one through two lenses. I look at it through a love heart point of view. How much you know, do you love doing what you're doing? How much does it fulfill you? How much do you enjoy the process of it? How much you know, can you get into a flow state, a deep state of engagement? If you're in a career, that means the work that you do, you love. If, if you're in a business, it means that the work that you're doing, you love and that you're passionate about. So we look at it through the love heart side there. 
Uh, and the second one that we look at is the dollar symbol. So always love heart and dollar symbol. And from a business point of view, what you wanna ask yourself is, am I loving what I'm doing? But also, is the business 2Xing every year? Is the business growing? You know, is it improving? Are you being able to replace yourself and leverage yourself to a point where you haven't got to do all the things? Or are you the, instead of being the CEO, are you the chief everything officer where you're stuck doing everything? So what I'm talking about here as well in business is not revenue. I think revenue is a real vanity metric. So revenue is vanity, profit, sanity. I'm talking, are you making the money that you want to make? Are you loving what you're doing? So a 10 here looks like, Tommy, love what I do. It's fucking awesome. Am I earning great money doing it? Life's good. A one looks like the love heart is small. I don't enjoy how I'm spending my time, full stop. Um, and the money's not quite there. A five's like kind of somewhere in between, meaning that I know that there's some, some, something more there for me. The next on the list is a pretty easy one. It's income. Income is the money that comes in. We refer to money at Mantastic as paper energy. So money is just paper energy to do the shit that you love to do. You can't take it with you when you die, uh, but it's here to make life fantastic. So looking at this one kind of comes off the back of business uh, and career as such. From a financial point of view, it's like, are you earning the money that you want? If you're looking at a 10 here, it's like, I've got enough money coming in for me to live a lifestyle that I want to live, do all the things that I want to do, and also set some to Uncle Ron, meaning later on into your future. A one looks like I'm caught in P to P, paycheck to paycheck, whether that's week to week um, or more monthly, month to month, uh, I'm, I'm limited. Uh, a five's like, I'm on a good wicket, but I know that there's more there for me. Again, how you think affects everything that you do. So I just wanna get you thinking today. Um, and again, I just want you to get to commit some stuff to paper and really figure out what you want. The goal, this is kind of like business planning for life. The goal is that you come out with a bunch of clarity, knowing your best next steps, knowing the next thing that you're going for. So income is an important one. And it's also probably the easiest one to go, oh yeah, but you know, money's not that important. Um, if you've got passions, you've got things you love, love to do, you know, a list of things you wanna do while you're on the planet, they all cost money. Um, and it's important to order, go, have I got enough coming in for my company, your name proprietary limited, or would I like a little bit more? It's not the be all and end all. You do get to a point where once you can do all the things you wanna do, it becomes about other stuff. Uh, but when you haven't got enough of it, it tends to be all you can think about. So where do you sit with that one? Five being somewhere in between. The next one on the list is uh, one of my favorites. And I had my ass handed to me on this particular topic. So obviously the next one we've got is a wealth creation plan. We refer to this as being the CFO, the chief financial officer. Come in brother, um, the CFO of your life. Now to give this some context, I'm 37 as I stand here today, 37 years young, I like to put it. I came from a small country town. You guys are probably gonna know uh, more where it is than the other, the other places, Sydney and uh, Brizzy and Auckland, et cetera, where we present. Uh, small country town called Horsham in Victoria. So uh, three hours from here, um, that's where I grew up. Um, I escaped, I always joke, I just escaped when I was 18 and I moved up to the Gold Coast. But we grew up in a small place, everyone knew each other's name, um, six pubs on one street, uh, really good time. Nothing, nothing fancy, just all really great people. I'm so grateful that I grew up there. I then went to a uni up on the Gold Coast, uh, a uni called Bond, I put myself through, but it was a private university. Uh, it's an interesting place because a lot of really wealthy parents send their kids there. So you've got kids who are my age, picture this, like I'm 19 years old, um, wearing Rolexes, driving Porsches on 100K allowances. Uh, and I'd never been exposed to a world of wealth. Like I'd never really knew about Porsche or Rolex or Louis Vuitton or any of this sort of stuff. I grew up playing video games, uh, going to land parties, playing video games and riding bikes. Bikes been my passion my whole life. And so here's me putting myself through uni, riding a ride on a street sweeper around all of my subjects. So cleaning, uh, cleaning streets and kind of like used to clean a place called Austral Brickworks that just dirty, dusty places underground, get rid of all the dust. And I used to clean fitness first, which is now good life. Uh, clean the swimming pool and, and, and clean the gym. Put myself through, but always had this big fire that I wanted to do something. So I graduate uni, um, while I was at uni, I got a, a training certificate. So I learned how to train people, had some good money coming in. This led to me getting involved in the fitness colleges. So I started speaking at the age of uh, 22 because I already had a good client base underneath me, sort of coaching personal training, et cetera. Started, was earning like early PT days, like a thousand bucks a week, got involved with the colleges, uh, or scaled that up a bit, got involved with the colleges, 
I started presenting, started training clients, uh, and kind of got into this world where I just love speaking. Um, first session I ever did was anatomy of the shoulder girdle, which is, uh, I don't think you blokes would have turned up for that one today, but the, um, got thrown in the deep end with speaking, and I just said yes, talk about entrepreneur mindset, I just said yes to every opportunity that came my way. What happened was I got thrown the bait to move over to Auckland uh, to be the senior presenter over at our Auckland College, um, then got thrown into head of sales, so running the sales department, then became a shareholder, and in the same time frame, sort of 12 to 18 months, opened up a business called TomFit, which was a small personal training studio. No one was charging 80 bucks a session at the time in 2009, and we took that in year one um, from zero to 700K uh, and a team of 12, which was really, really, really cool. Um, and essentially, I ended up kind of in a position where I'm 25 years old, earning about a quarter million bucks a year, uh, and had money coming in. Now, for someone who hasn't been taught wealth as a kid, for me, money was just a vehicle that when you get it, you spend it. So guess what I did? I had a fucking great time. I bought a Porsche, convertible. Um, I, amongst many things, a few fa really fast beamers as well. I got an apartment on the water in the viaduct. I had money coming in. I bought the Louis Vuitton briefcases, the shiny watches. Um, I, I went to restaurants, I drank champagne. I went, when I went on holidays, I went to Miami or LA. I did it exotic. But the challenge was that um, most of the time, the safe, safety account level in my bank account was like 4K. So I'd have money that come in. As long as I had four grand in my account, I would just spend it down. That was my happy place. Anyways, I'd rock up to Tom Fit in these outrageous jackets at the time, like literally ridiculous jackets. I'd get see these jackets in movies and I'd get them, just get them tailored. Um, always love sports jackets. There's this gentleman there, his name's Les. Les is a very successful businessman. He's 63 years old and I'll never forget him. Some of you heard me tell this story before because he's got Parkinson's. So when he talks to you, his hands are moving. And it's, you know, when someone talks to you, you can just tell that they're coming from such a real place. So he comes up to me and says, Tommy, young fella, I need to take you for coffee. I said, great. And so we started catching up coffee two, three times. About the third visit, he says, oh, we need to just catch up every week, have a conversation. About the third visit, he says to me, Tommy, it looks like you're doing great. Now, keep in mind, I'm driving around with my car with the roof off, wearing some fucking ridiculous, uh, ridiculous jacket, all these outrageous uh, clothes. I've got sports mode turned on on the exhaust most of the time, so you can hear me coming. Um, I'm, you know, Tom Fit number plates on the car. I'm like 20, 25 slash 26. We're at lunch, and because he used to just take the time to catch up with me. And he says, mate, it looks like you're doing great but is any of the money that you're making sticking to the sides? And first sign of ego is defensive body language, right? Like you talk back, you don't listen, it doesn't go through, you don't process what you say. So first thing I say back, I'm doing great. <laughs> Very defensive. He says, that's great, young man. All I want you to do between our, our lunch today and our lunch next week is write down on the left-hand side of a bit of paper all the things that you own. On the right-hand side of the paper, write down all the money that you owe. And then what I want you to do is come back to me with your net asset position. That's part one. He said in part two, stuck it, we call this a front stab in Mantastic, knife in the front, turn. Part two, what I want you to do is I want you to write down, so you've now got your net asset position and your number, I want you to write down all the money that you've earned. Now I'm only 26, right? So I've been earning for like four years. Write down all the money that you've earned. And then just come back to me with those numbers, please. And it's like, wow, right? If truth will set you free first, it will piss you off. From the outside, my world looked like I was worth like one and a half million bucks. Remember, my safety account, 4K. Money comes in, spend it down to 4K. Get down to two, I become resourceful, tighten the belt, bring it back up to four. Come back the next week. It's about fifteen and a half thousand dollars $1,000. i am like, fuck. He's like, how much have you earned, Tommy? I'm like, I don't know, like 600000 He's like, you happy with that? And I'm like, oh shit, not really. And so he got me really serious about a wealth creation plan when I was 26 and he said, you've got to give some to Uncle Ron, Ron meaning later on. He said, every guy needs to have a wealth creation plan written down in detail for his future. You need to know what your financial independence number is and you need to know what you've got to do to get there, you know, at least on your plan A, your slow steady way to get there. And so from that day, I took creating wealth really seriously. I started to get resourceful with uh, budgeting, I started to invest in myself and in my skill set and growing myself. Um, I started to take more of my income and put it towards my future. 
Um, I eventually went on to move on from the colleges and build my commercial health club and kind of do a bit of speaking stuff, which is what I really wanted to do. And I was fortunate enough to um, go through the process of having three of the biggest years in my life, uh, building my commercial health club. We built it up and I was lucky enough to be able to sell it. Someone wanted it more than me, got it into a position where it was just a rocket ship. The beautiful part is when I sold that business, I put that money into my investment trust and it still sits there. I did it when I was 31 and it still sits there, compounds away, does its thing. And I know my future self is just going to thank me for it. Like I haven't touched it. My old CFO, he would have had like two sports cars and a trip in Europe and a few other, and, and none of the money left. Just would have all been spent. So we've got to become a great CFO. So a one looks like I've got no clear cut wealth creation plan. A 10 looks like I've got a clear cut wealth creation plan, whether that's um, you know, stocks or managed funds or ETFs or property or crypto, whatever your thing is. And a five's like I'm a good saver. You know, five's like I'm a good saver. Something I'd like for everyone in this room, if you haven't got it, is in the next 12 to 18 months to get serious about your financial plan. Because so many people say, I'll get, I'll, you know, if I had more money, I'll be better at managing it. And what I learn is you get better at managing it. And when you get better at taking care of it, you get more. You know, it's super interesting. So we've taken a look at mindset, business, income, and wealth creation. Now, here's the next one. Next one's really, really important as a mantastic guy. Really important as a mantastic guy. It's decision making. My life got a heap better when I became a more decisive person. Just tell I didn't win any art comps, so. This is me and you. We've got to make a decision. Do we pick path A? Or do we pick path B? Both paths are 12 kilometers. What should we do? The answer is just make a decision. PTFT, pull the fucking trigger, do something. Now, if you pick the wrong decision, and let's say that you go 12 kilometers down path A, you go, okay, that's the wrong way. But let's say that's only seven kilometers across here. Now what do you know? You know the right way. You know the right way. And so what I've found, I'll give you an example, right? At the peak of my corporate career, my entrepreneur career, so I had my side business, TomFit, which had a team of 12, and I was head of sales, one of the senior presenters, and involved with colleges. And I was like hamstrung, doing two things, 100 hours a week, uh, I spoke to you, a couple of you today about neglect. Like I was just working my ass off, uh, but neglecting family, neglecting my health and fitness, neg neglecting my hobbies, all the things that I loved. At the peak of it, I knew that my bandwidth was just spread. I knew that my fulfillment was gone. I wasn't doing the shit that I love. My relationship with mum and dad had been pushed out way further than it should be. Um, I'd had a partner that had, uh, she'd left. She was an awesome chick, but she left because I was never home. And I knew but I also had this great security called an income coming in. Great security um, and a successful studio. So, you know, multiple six figures. I reckon I sat in indecision. So I sat here, didn't make a decision, down the bottom for probably stayed 18 months too long. Who can relay, like hands up, who sat on a decision for too long and you've just sat there and you know you could have made it way sooner, right? Like we all have decisions that we could have made way sooner. And I'm a huge believer that the world rewards fast decision makers. Like, yes, you gotta calculate it, but as a fantastic guy, you wanna become a decisive person. You wanna, cause when you make a decision, you can get in and get after it. It's not the jump that kills you many times. It's the weight. And so when I realized that essentially in the past I'd spent, you know, I'm gonna call it 18 months cause that's what it should have been. I spent 18 months not picking path A or path B, but just sitting there in indecision, in freeze mode, and we talk about mindset and we call them ants at Mantastic, automatic negative thoughts. When you sit in indecision, you're gonna get about 50 acronyms today as well. Um, I can almost speak a whole language in acronyms, almost. Uh, when we talk about the ants creeping in, the longer you stay in procrastination, like old saying procrastination is the assassination of motivation, it's so true and the ants will just creep in and it's kind of like an inception of mindset. So again, as I say today, if you've got anything you need to make a decision on, just make a decision. A 10 looks like Tommy. I'm a bloody legend at making decisions, mate. 
I'm rocking it. Like I'm making the decisions that I need to make. Here's a good quote for you to write down. Make the decisions that move you forward in life. A great CEO of their company, either business or life, knows how to make the decisions that moves them forward in life. So for me, when I'm with myself, I like to think of myself as my own best mate. I always say to myself, Tommy, make the decisions that are going to move you forward in life. There generally tends to be true decisions, only true decisions you can make. The easy decision and the right decision. And the right decision is rarely the easy decision. So 10's like I'm a decisive decision maker. One's like, Tommy, I've been, for context, indecisive, but I'm gonna change that, bless you. And a five's like I'm somewhere in between. Sometimes I pull the trigger, sometimes I don't. Next one on the list is really kind of follows on from decision making and it's confidence. Now, I don't think of confidence as, you know, being some alpha dude. Um, that's fake confidence, you know. The old saying, uh, coins rattle and paper money is silent. To me, real confidence is just someone who's expressing themselves. Like you look at the Instagram, the social medias, all that sort of stuff. People portray this fake confidence, right? They're trying to impress other people, but internally they're lonely. You know, like if you're doing something to impress others, then you're missing the whole point. If you're doing something to express who you are and you're just being you, that's real confidence, right? Like as real confidence, you look at most of the elite martial artists, they don't go around going, I could whoop your ass, I could whoop your ass, I could whoop your ass, I could look, whoop your ass. They're so humble, right? Whereas you, you know, go for a wander at, um, around the streets at 2 a.m. in the morning, it's a, it's a little bit different. So remember, paper money silent, coins rattle. Now confidence is an interesting one because for some of us, and I've spoke to some of you on the phone, you know, you've been through a phase where, you know, maybe you're in a relationship and that relationship broke down and, um, you know, it's taken a hit to your confidence. You don't see the kids as much and stuff like that. Um, it could be, you know, for some people that a business, a business that has failed or something that's happened uh, with money or put on a bit of weight or whatever it might be. Um, just an interesting one to, to look at. I don't believe in the whole alpha thing here. I just believe like you should live your man brand, be your man brand and just do you. To me, that's the best confidence. But, you, but linking kind of like mindset, personal brand, the stuff I've spoke about so far, we want you to be in a point where you're confident to, to PTFT. Sometimes confidence as well, that's one of those things that can be borrowed from other people. Like I look at what happens inside of our community and we use the term PTFT, pull the fucking trigger. Many times when you see others PTFT, guess what you do? You pull the trigger. When you see others earning more money, guess what you do? You make the decisions that you need to make to move yourself forward. When you see others getting fit and in shape, you do the same thing. So confidence is just the ability to back yourself. A 10 with that one looks like I'm backing myself, Tommy. I'm pulling the trigger. I'm pretty happy with that. A one's like, I've kind of lost me. Um, and I've been in this place before where, you know, I went through a phase where I'd just been working so, so much. Um, and I was just chasing success, like chasing success because I never had it. And the rest of my life had fallen to bits. Relationship with my partner, it had gone, she left. Relationship with mum and dad, out the window, it had, it had gone. Uh, I'd stopped training and my kind of thing that fills my bucket up is, is riding. I've ridden bikes my whole life. Um, you know, I love house music, I love metal. I just stopped doing all the shit that I love. And I kind of lost me and because of that, my confidence had taken a bit of a hit. So again, where do you sit with this one? The one's like, um, you know, it's gone missing a bit. I'm not my own best mate. The 10's like, I am my own best mate. And a five's like somewhere in between. Next one is super important. And I love this one. This is one that, you know, back in the old days, how stress used to be is you killed the tiger or the tiger killed you. Stress didn't really exist, right? What happened? You're wandering around. This is my interpretation, by the way. I wasn't there. You're wandering around. All of a sudden, tiger comes out. You think, fuck, that's a tiger. What does your body do? Releases adrenaline, noradrenaline, your pupils dilate, your heart starts beating faster, your body releases glucose and fat into your bloodstream to provide more energy, and you go, let's go. Then, it's you versus tiger. One of two things happens. You kill the tiger, guess what? No more stress. Second thing happens, tiger kills you, no more stress. <laughs> Easy. Nowadays, stress is completely different. You know, it's your body, you're the host. We're technically like a big pot plant that walks around in the sun. For a lot of people, those symptoms that I just experienced, faster heart rate, you know, body releasing glucose and fat into the bloodstream, pupils dilating, we wake up into like stress city because of pressure of family, because of pressure of um, financials, because of pressure of work and deadlines. And because of that pressure, sometimes comes other things that don't aid with mindset, things like 
uh, alcohol, drugs, poor eating, uh, stuff like that can really creep in. So I'm a big believer as a guy, and I'll talk about this today in R&R, &R, that every guy, should, every guy should have an R&R &R plan. You need to have a way to get you out of the pressure cooker of life. Life is a pressure cooker and you need to have a way to get you out of it. I love writing. Now I'm not the best writer anymore. Um, I took a big knock a couple of years back and uh, managed to clean snap my uh, radius, uh, which wasn't, wasn't too fun. Um, and I still crash quite frequently, but I love writing. I've spoke to Eden about this. I love writing because when I'm out riding, everything is at 100%. My heart and lungs are beating out of my chest. Um, I'm going up, the, that's all I'm doing. And I come back and I'm not holding on to anything in my body. I'm like, I'm cool. Gets me clear, it gets me focused. When I didn't have a fun plan, when I didn't have an R&R &R plan outside of it, I felt like constantly stressed all the time. It was way easier for me to tell someone to fuck off. Uh, I was on a short fuse and I was just generally kind of like always in a hurry, a bit more of a Mr. Grumpy, because I didn't have an effective R&R &R plan. So when you look at this, do you guys know this? Like, how much does stress rub off on family, the people you love, your mum, your dad, your brother, your sister, your partner, your kids if you have them, when you're in a stressed out state? We all need a plan to get out of the pressure cooker. So with this one, let's just reverse uh, this one. A one is Tommy, I don't do stress. I have next to zero, like um, I have next to no stress. A 10 is like, I'm completely stressed out. Like I'm living in a world of stress. I'm on a really, really, really short fuse in relation to um, how I'm wired, my, my physiology is wired. Yeah, and you know that, right? Things creep in. Caffeine, alcohol, always in a hurry, go, go, go mode. Um, and a five, some somewhere in between. We'll talk about it in R&R. &R. I'm just a big believer. And obviously the more you set yourself up in CFO, the more R&R &R stuff you have, the, the, the less stress you can, you, you sort of have in your life. I'm a big believer in not doing stress anymore because I gave, I had three years where I gave my body a really, really, really hard time um, and I was sort of like team no sleep, whereas now I'm kind of like the opposite, be the best R&R &R coach I can be, get me out of the pressure cooker so I can make great decisions. So where do you sit with that one? Next on the list, a couple of favourites coming up here. Uh, next on the list is relationships and this one is relatively simple. Uh, the quality of your life will be determined by the quality of the people th that you have in it and the quality of the relationships that you have with them. So when you think about this one, kind of think of your life as a board table. Whoever you hang around, you'll become the fifth. You hang around, hang around four unmotivated, um, not disciplined, overweight, big drinkers, partiers, you know, not getting after their goals, you become the fifth. You hang around four people who are having a crack, who are having a go, who are pulling the trigger, good genuine hearts, guess what? You become the fifth. When I look at relationships, I'm not about quantity of relationships. It's so easy to know a lot of people. I'm about quality of relationships. And one of the things I'm so grateful for in my life is my relationship with my mum and my dad. I called them both this morning. They're off to a, uh, a Credence concert in Barham, if anyone knows where that is. Uh, and I'm just so grateful. My, the relationship is just... It's beautiful. Uh, my best mate, Greg, like we, we on the phone nearly every day, uh, catch up once every couple of weeks. And we're not sitting there boasting, going, I've achieved this or I've achieved that. We're talking through challenges and what the next milestone is, is to pass. I look at the Mantastic community, a group of really authentic legends around Australia, having a crack at their goals, really grateful for that. So the people you have in your life, they're either gonna bring the best out of you as you go up the mountain, and they're gonna inspire you to climb harder, or they're gonna serve as an anchor to pull you back. Um, or it might just be like a campsite where you're standing there and it's like the campsite's kind of normal, there's a lot of comfort, but you're not growing. We look at a 10 for relationships and a 10 for relationships is like, I'm the small fish in the big pond. The people that I've got in my life, they're pushing me to grow, they're demanding me to, to be better. More, most importantly, they're inspiring me and I love them. A one's like, I've got a quantity of relationships, I know a lot of people, but there's no depth, you know, there's no depth. And a five's like somewhere in between. When we think of your life as a board table, when, and when we chat later today about the board table that you want to build, you have to hire, hire, train and fire accordingly. So you might have some places at your board table that you can fill, um, you know, that you need to fill. Maybe someone who's done in business what you want to do. Maybe someone who's done in wealth building what you want to do. Maybe someone who's done with their physique what you want to do. Maybe someone who's got the, 
the quality of relationship that you'd like to have. You may have some people at your table when you review the table that you think, hang on a minute, this table isn't that big. There's only a limited number of seats. I might have to remove some people from this table or at least stop spending as much time with them. So tens like relationships are solid, ones like relationships aren't quite there, a five is somewhere in between. Now I'm going to go, the, the next one that I've got on the list, um, I'm actually going to skip one and I'm going to go down to leadership skills just because they tie in really well together. From a leadership skill perspective, I believe leadership and relationships are, are directly related. So for me, my world got better when I became a better leader. Now leadership, for those of you that own a business, you'll know that you've got to lead your customers and most importantly, you've got to lead your team. Uh, in terms of being a fantastic guy, one of the people that you have to lead, the hardest one to lead, is yourself. So I started with leading myself and I started with making the decisions that I needed to make to get me where I wanted to go. I'm a huge believer, that's why I use the metaphor, be the CEO of your life, make the decisions that move you forward in life and start leading yourself. Like I said, there's an easy decision and the right decision. The easy decision is to not run tomorrow. The right decision is to go for a run, you know, or go to the gym, whichever way you look at it. So start by leading yourself and leave today and get, get you know, do the things that you need to do to get your life in order. I've, I remember once my old boss, um, we were on a night out, me and my mate, and I had, so I'd previously been on the Gold Coast and I had a black Porsche convertible and I just bought a 330 Coupe E46 when I moved over to New Zealand. I uh, actually became a huge Beamer fan kind of later on in that journey. But at the time, to me, this blue Beamer that I'd bought was, it was like I got it out of Grand Theft Auto. Like it just, it wasn't the Porsche to me. And so I used to drive it like I stole it. Um, I didn't clean it as much as I should have. Um, it was kind of messy inside, the outside was messy. Whereas my Porsche, when I had it back on the Gold Coast before I moved to Auckland, I'd get home, I'd get the towel out, I'd go around the wheels, I'd towel the car, it just looked immaculate. But to me, I'd, I'd kind of, because I was building my business, I'd gone back a bit and um, I went to myself, okay, sweet, I'll just get this car. Bought it from a, a place in Henderson called Rollies Cars. Drove it like I stole it. And one day we're on a night out, so I used to work really, really hard. Uh, you know, doing sort of 80, 90, 100 hours a week. And G, who some of you guys know, and myself, would occasionally sneak in the odd night out. Get out of the pressure cooker of life, go and have a fun night. When you're 25, 26, you can pretty much do, it, do anything uh, the next day uh, after you've been enjoying some spice rums. When you're 35 or 36, you most definitely cannot. Uh, so we used to be able to go out, no consequences, all was good. Anyway, this particular time, we came home at like four in the morning and uh, when we were out, my boss had messaged me at about 12.30. I hadn't seen the message saying, Tommy, now keep in mind, my boss had been um, on the, the BRW list and had achieved some pretty amazing stuff. Um, they had some really nice cars, um, a really amazing Porsche 911, which I loved. And he said, Tommy, uh, just leave the key on the tire, mate. I'll grab your car tomorrow. You come in with G, well, you come in in the company RAV. I need to borrow your car tomorrow. I read this message at 4 a.m. I'm like, oh shit. Now my car didn't quite have Macca's wrappers in it or anything like that, but dirty inside, dirty outside. I leave the key on the tire and I think, oh man, I'm in for it here. Because most of the people I have in my life, they just front stab me. You know, they just, they're really good at front stabbing me and giving me feedback. If I put on any weight, if I've got lazy, if I've got complacent, they're just there and like, pow, pow, pow. Anyway, this time, go and do work for the day. It's a Sunday, I'm working on a Sunday. Work from nine through to five. My mate G, we've become great mates because we work together, we're like brothers. He says to me, um, I'll drive you out, we'll go get the car. We pull in, we're in the company Rev4, and we go to my car, and we're driving in, it's a three car garage, there's a Porsche 911 on this side. There it is, my car, this blue BMW 330 coupe, and it looks immaculate. It's been cut and polished, I can tell the interior has been done, the wheels are shiny, I'm thinking to myself, fuck, I'm in for a chat here. My boss sits me down and goes, Tommy, your car, let's have a chat about it. And he, he said, tell me about your gold car. And I said at the time, Porsche 911. He said, right, who do you think you need to become to deserve that car? I said, well, more successful. And anyway, all these questions went on and on and on. Right? Tell me about this car. How are you treating this car? What's going on here? Oh, he's, he's like, exactly what he was like, what the fuck's going on with this one? And what he refer was referring to is like, if you don't start to step up and be the Porsche 911 owner now, or the person that you need to be now, you're never gonna get what you want. 
And so this has made me really reflect on being a leader with myself in terms of just taking no excuses, being in great shape, keeping the house immaculate, keeping the bank accounts uh, immaculate, not waiting till I had money, keeping the car immaculate, you know, like operating it like it's for sale. It's the thing that ultimately helped me sell my business was operating it like it was for sale, right? So I had this chat, always kept the car clean since then, had a few really nice cars since then, but it was such, a, such an interesting one. So it starts by leading yourself and don't be a lazy leader of your company, right? Don't be a lazy leader, leader of your life. Then as leadership's grown and evolved, leadership starts with others, right? Like I look at my mum and my dad, they used to lead me when I was younger. They, you know, we've all been in that situation. Now I look at my mum and my dad, I'm, uh, I'm sad because last time we were here, dad was actually in the room uh, and my little sister's fiance was in the room too, um, which was really, really cool. But I look at mum and dad and I'm sure you guys can probably relate to this. They've started to become a little bit older and act a little bit older, you know, like dad will wear the shoes until they're nearly dead. Like he'll wear the shoes until they just get, they're completely worn out. Um, I've learned to be a leader in my parents' life and go, you know, get the caravan, buy it, do it, go and do the trip around Australia. Um, a, a few years ago, inside of Mantastic, we used the concept of sprints, which I'll talk about the Savo. We were having running the Shirts Off Club Challenge, it's an eight week physique challenge. And um, one of the guys, he'd made a, a, a bit of money in, in crypto. He sent me an Apple Watch. So a really nice state of the art model, like Apple Watch with all the cellular and everything. And I'm starting to track steps. So we're at this stage, we're kind of doing like 16,000 steps a day towards the end of it. And uh, I go into mum's house and mum says, because uh, I went back to uh, Horsham during COVID, I wanted to be close to my parents. Dad was in and out hospital, etc. Mum looks over, she's like, what's that? What's that watch? I'm like, oh, mum, that's an Apple watch. And then she's like, um, what does it do? I'm like, oh, it tracks your steps. And she's like, oh, I think I want an Apple watch. I'm like, mum, you should get one go back a second time she goes how's the watch going oh it's good mum I think I want an Apple watch um and I'm like, you should get just go and do it like honestly just go and do it this happened maybe a third or a fourth time and I went I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a leader for mum I got sent one as a gift so I went down to Harvey Norman bought one for her uh and ga gifted her an Apple watch guess what being a leader for my mum is done ever since that day every time she calls me how many steps you on you know how many steps you on what podcast you've been listening to? She's flat out listening to Huberman and like, watch this one, it's on the brain. Watch this one, it's on alcohol. Watch this one. You know, but it's so good. This one little thing that I did for my mum has got her doing more. My dad's had uh, quite a few challenges in COVID, was in hospital for three months, like pretty hard stuff, right? And I'm like, mum, dad, live your life. Live your life, don't leave it to us. Get out there, do the trip around Australia. Go to the places, do the things that you want to do. Generally, when I present, they're at Credence this weekend. Last month, I presented in Sydney. Um, my dad can't fly anymore because he's got some nerve challenges in his back and my mum just loves getting up to the beach. So what I'll do is when I'm presenting here, normally if I'm in Melbourne, I'll book mum a ticket up to Queensland, get her to spend three or four days at my place on the beach and just give her a little holiday. You know, encouraging the parents to be the best they can be. My little sister, being a leader for her, encouraging her to be the best she can be. So being a leader is really amazing. You've got to start by being a leader for yourself. For those of you with businesses, you've got to start by being a leader for your team. Be a leader for your clients. It's so great for your man brand to be known as the guy who takes no shit, number one, for himself. Like a lot of you guys in Mantastic know, I'm hard on you guys, I demand more, but I demand more out of myself. Be known as a person who's a leader for everyone else and brings out the best in everyone else including the people near and dear to you and especially the ones that have been leaders throughout your life as well. Interesting one. Tens like, if I talk about this, I'll go right through to 5 p.m. Um, tens like, I've been a conscious leader. I've been awesome at it, Tommy. A one's like, you know what? There's a lot of work to be doing here, Number, in, you know, including myself and others, of course. And a five's like, I'm somewhere in between. Four more for us to, uh, to rock and roll through here, champions, as we are going through. We will, we will have a break around about 2.30. Four more for us to rock and roll through. Next one is marketing, uh, sales and communication skills. So my life, uh, again, like my life got better when I learned this one. I'm a huge believer that every man should learn two skills, three skills actually, how to market, how to sell, and how to speak in public. For those of you, like if you look at that, right, like how to market means that you can bring a lead into your world. Whether you're a single bloke looking, you know, to go out on the town tonight, that's marketing. Um, whether you're looking for a career promotion, whether you're looking to get customers for your business, that's marketing. Learning to sell, 
you know, provided you've got a world-class product and what you're doing is awesome, means that you've got the skills to convert the leads that come into your world. Everyone needs to learn how to sell. I learned how to sell, I hated it in the beginning. Like you guys go, oh, this is Tommy, he talks really, really fast. Um, he seems like he's a natural when he's having a conversation with me here today. I got taught to sp just always speak without slides. But when I started, I was like a robot. I'm an extroverted introvert. Like I just learned this stuff. And when I learned how to sell, it helped me build my health club. Um, we got to four digits worth of members, became a very profitable place, ultimately went on to sell it. Most of the great things that have happened in my life have been due to my ability to communicate. The mentors that I've attracted in, the tribe that I've attracted in, the great friends uh, that I have, the, the money that I've made, the things I've been able to negotiate, all communication skills. And I'm just throwing on top of that, speaking in public, because I think if you think of yourself as your highest and best self, it's a skill that everyone should be able to do. It might not mean that you want to be here today and do a conversation like this, <coughs> But being able to own it for your best mate's wedding speech or, you know, rock the house down for something at work or even just content on camera, right? For a lot of you business owners to grow your business, be com uh, comfortable behind a camera and just own it. So marketing, sales and speaking skills are a must. They're, they're, they're a must. And the only thing I'll add to that is in a really authentic way, like in a way that is most authentic to your man brand. You don't have to be anyone that you're not, but do it in an authentic way. And make a pact to yourself that you're going to learn that skill. There's nothing that will um, move you forward uh, more in life than learning how to market and sell. So with that, it's like, Tommy, I'm a confident communicator. You know, I know how to sell. I think about what I'm going to say. I know how to package it. I know how to wrap it up. With a one, it's like, I know what I want to say. I'm just not saying it. Like it's the words don't come out of my mouth. And with a five, it's like the things that I'm passionate about, um, I'm pretty good with. Three more. Next on the list we've got physique. Now, physique's a pretty easy one to audit. I'll give you the best way to audit your physique tomorrow morning. When you wake up, walk to the mirror, just undies on, take a look and go, what's going on here? You know, that's, that's, the, that's it. We use it at Mantastic. We use the, uh, the, the idea of a shirt's off physique. Just liking what you see with your shirt off. Now, that's going to be a different benchmark for everyone. But... You know, you go walk up to the mirror and go, how do I feel here? Like, is my physique on point? Is it, you know, is it where I want it to be or is there work to be done? And just be honest and truthful for it. There was a stage, I'll talk about the Shirts Off Club later. There was a stage where I, like I've been in good shape most of my life. I'll tell you the story later as to how I did that. There was a stage when I sold my business, um, I decided to take a year off and I just went and traveled. I've been working for 10 years, took a year off, I'm so glad I did, especially with COVID and stuff, the way that it all, all happened. So I went to Mexico, the US and Canada. Now, I ended up staying in Canada way longer than what I thought. I just love Vancouver, awesome city. And my mate used to go to work every day. I'd go and kind of like work in the library, uh, but I didn't really have, you know, I was sort of taking a year off. I'd go do a bit of work and reading in the library. And I'd normally meet him at five. Um, so I had to fill the day in. I went and explored, did stuff. I figured it was a great idea to use my marketing and sales skills and do a lot of dating in Canada at that particular time. So what happened was my Monday to Friday, I'd go on a date every day at about three o'clock. It was awesome fun, met some amazing people. On that date, not having anywhere to be tomorrow, I might have three, four, maybe five beers. Uh, and about my fifth week into that, because I was in Canada for, for quite a bit, I worked my ass off for like a decade. About my fifth week into that, I went to the mirror and I went, gee whiz. What's going on here, Tommy boy? Uh, I'd always proclaim myself being like president of the Shirts Off Club in our Mantastic framework. I was definitely not in Shirts Off Club condition. I went, fuck, that's a one, right? Like it's like, I'm not liking what I'm seeing here. Like there's a, a patio over the playground, too much time in the pasture, not enough time on the racetrack type of thing. And I went, this isn't good. So I rectified it. And I'll talk about the system for doing that later. A 10's like, no, I'm happy with my physique, happy to take my shirt off. And a five's like somewhere in between. I'm a huge believer that physique is a force multiplier. So when you have your physique on point, like when you're doing, especially all the habits that you have when your physique's on point, how you eat, your training, doesn't matter whether you're a gym person or you do uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or whatever your method is, ride bikes like me. When you're training, you're eating well, you're sleeping well, everything else goes better. Here we're just talking purely about your physique point of view. So where does that sit on a one, a five and a 10? One more down the list, we've got man brand and personal brand. Now, man brand kind of is linked to physique, right? So man brand is, if you think of Conor McGregor, he's got a man brand. If you think of The Rock, 
he's got a man brand. If you think of Tony Hawk, he's got uh, a man brand. Uh, anyone been watching the new series of Arnie on Netflix? He's got a man brand. We all have a personal brand that's out there in the marketplace. We all are a brand in the marketplace. So this is how you dress, how you walk, how you talk, how you're perceived. People see this like we shouldn't judge a book by its cover. We shouldn't, but we do. We go, who's he? Who's she? Who's that sophisticated dude? Who is she? Like, we do it, right? We judge visually. People will make a, a perception about you based on what they see, whether that's through Facebook, through Instagram, through LinkedIn, through you walking uh, on, on the street. If you guys saw me today, and I went over to the Easy Mart to get my sparkling water, which I always do for these sessions because I run out of our uh, voice, and you saw me and I was rude to the Easy Mart or to uh, rude to the Hilton staff downstairs, you'd think you'd, you'd make a judgment of me, right? So this is your personal brand. Perception is everything. How you walk, talk, smell. We'll talk about it in product development and branding. Attends like, are you owning that to the best it can be? Have you put conscious time, effort, thought, and energy into it? Particularly in 2023, right? Like we're all a brand. Have you thought about that? A one's like I've put no thought at all into my man brand. And the reason that like I'm a huge believer that how you think determines how you feel and how you feel determines what you do. So the reason that we have a dress code for coming in today, the reason we run it at the Hilton, it's part of the brand, you know? Like, I want you to feel good there. So a 10's like I put a heap of thought into it. A 1's like I've kind of neglected my personal brand. I haven't thought about it too much. And a 5's like somewhere in between, you know? Like, you know, I keep my hair cut on point, um, but I haven't put a whole heap of time, effort, energy, and love into it. And last but not least on the list is lifestyle. And this is a really interesting one. Uh, when you think of lifestyle, just think of it like this. Think of Frank Sinatra, and Frank Sinatra had, I did it my way. So lifestyle, we break the word down. It's a life lived with style. You, put, you look at all of this stuff, and it's like the house you live in, the car you drive, the city you live in, and most importantly, my favorite one, how you spend your time. You know, How are you spending your time? The most important thing with lifestyle. I've met plenty of people who are big KPMG earners, which is amazing, but their lifestyle sucks. I've been one of those people where I'm working 100 hours a week, I'm earning great money, but I had no lifestyle. I'm not writing, like one, a couple of things that light me up. Great music, love house music, love metal. Love, um, love riding enduro, like uh, mountain bikes. Uh, grew up riding BMX my whole life. Um, love getting a chance to, uh, to walk my do dog. Love action movies. Uh, love a good night out. Love spending time with friends. You know, I look now, the lifestyle I have, I live on the beach up at the Gold Coast, which is really, really nice. I drive the car I wanna drive, I live where I wanna live, I'm doing all the things that I wanna do. Most important one, I'm spending my time in the way that I want to. That's lifestyle. So 10's like I've got that nailed, one's like, you know, I'm not living the life that I want, and a five's like somewhere in between. What I want you to do with your list, really quickly, is just take a look there. So you're gonna notice a few things. If we're looking through the lens of the next 12 to 18 months and getting you a hockey stick, um, because this is a lens I want to look on the second half of today on. If we're looking at the, through the lens of like your hockey stick for the next 12 to 18 months, there'll be a top three on the list. There'll be a three that are your top three. There will be a three that are your bottom three. What I want you to look for is make a note of what are my most important three. A good CEO of any company knows that the most important thing is to make the most important thing the most important thing. So when you look at your list, what are the three biggest areas over the next 12 to 18 months if you were to have a five year hockey stick that are important for you to get sorted? That's what I want you to look at. Just make a note. Now before I open it up to conversation amongst each other, just one more thing that I wanna to, want to add to this. Uh, and this goes off the back end of the life audit. Uh, we call this exercise the four forces. And it goes a little bit like this. Up the top, we have things that are immediate. Down the bottom, we have things that are in the future. On this side, we have the negative, and on this side, we have the positive. Now, something I want you to get, in the, get used to speaking about, and especially as we look at each role in the second half, is understanding these two terms, COI and ROI. COI says cost of inaction. Meaning if I don't do something about this, where will I be in 12 months, 24 months, five years, 20 years? ROI says, if I do do something about it, 
where will that put me? Understanding that many times you have to go through a dip to do that. So when we look at this in the four forces, up the top we've got immediate negatives. We call these your frustrations. And if you look at what frustrations are, these are, are really easy, right? Like if we go through the list that we've just been through, it's like mindset might not be on, my mindset might be off point. Business isn't, business isn't growing. Income mightn't be where I want it to be. There's no wealth creation plan in place. Physique and man brand aren't where I want them to be. From a perspective of marketing and sales, you know, I haven't got the, the communication skills that I want. My stress has gone, you know, stress has gone through the roof. Um, relationships are a little bit rocky. You know, it could be like, I'm not my own best mate. I feel like I've lost myself. Um, you guys know what this is for you because it's, it's just what you're feeling right now, whatever the frustrations are. On the right hand side, we've got immediate and happy. We call these your wants. And your wants, and I want you to write these out as we're going through it for you, wants are the things that you want right now. They're typically the exact opposite of your frustrations. So if business isn't growing, what do you want? You want business to be growing. If money's not flowing in, you know, the way that you like it, it's like, well, what I really want is the income. You know, if the wealth creation plan is not in place, what do I want? To be investing regularly. If my physique's not on point and I'm not training, what do I want? I can see all the eyes going towards the food. Um, I just whipped it up myself before the sesh, guys, so no stress. Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, if we're not training, what do we want? We want to be, want to be training. You know, if whatever, wh whatever is on the left-hand side, typically our wants are the exact opposite. And remember, these are the things that we want right now. So business not growing, growing. Mindset not on point, mindset on point. You know, nutrition not good, want to be eating well. Drinking too much, don't want to be, don't want to be drinking. Um, not, you know, not making time for mountain bikes, I want to be making time to ride frequently. Not investing, I want to be investing. Not, you know, not around a good tribe, good board, I want to be around a good tribe, good board. They just speak to one another. But the interesting thing about these two, right, is that so many times in terms of COI and ROI, and you know, if you ever stall on a decision, just ask myself, not what's it going to cost me to do, but what's it going to cost me not to do? You know, what's it going to cost me not to do? If you look at it, generally the easier decision today is to do nothing. So if you're here, like when you look at pulling the trigger, so many times you have to ride a dip to do it. Like I look back on my career, when I resigned and I went out to open my own business, went all in on it, gave it 100%, what did I have to give up? My paycheck. My frustration was I'm working 100 hours a week. What I want is to not be doing that. I'm over here earning great money, but I had to give up to, in order to, to get. And so all I could see was these two, and sometimes it's just better the devil you know. So many times it's better the devil you know. You're in a relationship that you know, you, you, you know in your heart of hearts isn't going to last forever. But you know it, it's warm, it's safe, it's fuzzy, it's comfortable. Same goes for a career, a business, whatever it might be. So we, stay, we want something else, but we stay there because it's comfortable. If you want to kick your ass into gear, where you really need to look is future motivators. And so future motivators in the negative are what we call the cost of inaction. Meaning if I don't get off my ass and do something about this, where will I be in 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, 48 months, five years, what does that look like? You know. Now, for some of you who've, and I've spoke to, I'll, I'll give you the system after the break, but for some of you, you've been through the business side and you know that you've been so flat out on business that you've neglected other areas of your life. You've neglected your fitness, you've neglected your relationships, you've neglected your hobbies, um, you've neglected some, you know, some wealth creation plan, whatever it might be, but I've been flat out in the business. What's the cost of inaction? Well, if you don't, you know, I'll give you a few angles of it. You don't get the relationship sorted, the COI is easy, 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, 48 months, you know, five years, 20 years, might end up being divorced. It might end up being alone if you're a single dude and you're not getting out there and marketing yourself. It might be that your kids grow up and you don't get to, to know them, right? If, if it's health and fitness related stuff, the COI is kind of like, well, in five years time or 10 years time, if I don't get my ass in gear, I could end up um, sick, you know? Highest risk for guys, if you're an internalizer of stress, you've got a higher risk of cancer. If you're an externalizer, externalizer of stress, where you tell people to get stuffed way easier, you've got a higher risk of heart attack and stroke. You know, so you look at the COI of, of doing that. If you are in a career and you want to open a business, but you're not pulling the trigger on it and you're not moving forward, your COI is really simple. It's regret. It's like in, in 12 months, 24 months, five years, I'll have regret, but not for the things that I did, for the things that I didn't do. 
on that note, so many times when you talk about making a decision, you're actually living your own worst case scenario. You're living it, you know? So you're living your worst case scenario. I look back at my career, I was in sales, I was a weapon. What's my worst case scenario? I go out, have a crack on my own. Guess what, I can get my old job back. So you have to understand what your COI is, you know? The, um, many times the COI as well is being in the same place in 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. You know, living, that might be the same house, the same car, the same income, living a photocopy of life, you know? And as they say, like, don't live the same year 75 times and call it a life. Average guy lives 4,000 weeks. 4,000 weeks on this planet, crazy, right? Pull the trigger, get after your goals. So I want you to get really clear on what your COI is. On the opposite side of COI, we have our ROI, meaning that if we take a look at pulling the trigger, getting out there, we know we're here, we wanna go here. If we don't do it, this is where we'll be, but if we do do it, this is what it looks like. Typically, ROI is more like things like, I did it, you know, I did it, I'm proud. If you're looking from a wealth creation point of view, freedom and choice, you know, if you're looking from a father point of view, being a great dad, great relationship with my kids, if you're looking from a partner point of view, being totally in love, being in a, in a great relationship, um, you're looking from, go back to CFO, it's like completely financially independent. You know, go back to business and it's like, I gave it a crack. I gave it a crack, I did what I wanted to do. You think about the experiences that you wanna have, the things you wanna accomplish, again, same deal. You know, saying that you did it. So everything that I've been through today, it's important to look at your life and I think the easiest person to deceive is yourself, it always is. Business isn't growing, money's not growing, wealth's not growing, relationships aren't where we want, physique's on point. So easy to tell ourselves a story. Just tell yourself the truth because that's the, the first part that's really, really, really important. You know what you want and many times we're scared to step forward. And I, I get it, like you do need to have a system and structure which I'll talk about the other side of the break to have, have you move forward. You do need to have accountability. But we know we wanna move forward, but we don't because we know this side and it's safe and secure. And comfort zones, right? Comfort zones are such an interesting thing. It is so easy to get caught in what we call an okay trap. And with an okay trap, the more comfortable you are, the more you sit in comfort, if your okay trap is like this, you're pretty sweet. Because to get out of your comfort zone, if you're in here, you haven't got to go too far. But, but, if you keep your OK trap in the same place and you know that there's stuff that you need to do and it just gets bigger and bigger, it's harder and harder to get out of the OK trap. The longer you spend in the OK trap, where things are OK, but they're not fantastic, the bigger the price of, of COI that you'll pay. You might be frustrated, but you're, you're frustrated and comfortable. Again, when you pull the trigger, if you're Going to pull the trigger, you'll have to, it's a strong one, that uh, black permanent marker. If you pull the trigger, you might be here and you want to go here, but you've got to cut a vine. In other words, make a sacrifice to get you up to here. The only thing that I can say is like in being the CEO of your life, get good at pulling the Band-Aid off sooner. Sooner you pull the Band-Aid off, Get through the pain to get to the promised land. I've watched so many people, you know, not do this. I've watched people do this and 12 to 18 months later, like if I'm to talk to you on getting five years worth of growth in a year, I would be absolutely bullshitting you if I said it's easy. To get all areas of your life sorted, to be in a great place, be one of the hardest things you've ever done. But it's so fucking rewarding because life is so great when you're just doing the thing that you know you need to be doing. The hardest thing is, is indecision, sitting here. I've watched so many people sit here in the okay trap. And the okay trap is like a snowball rolling down a hill compounding and they just let it build and build and build. I've watched people sit in these sessions with me before and come back 12 months later and they're in the same place. You know, a year of my life just been on autopilot, on rinse and repeat, I'm in the same fucking position that I was. That's not life, you know? They've let their okay trap. I've sat there, like if you ever, you know, you, and, and it's a hard thing to do. Sit with someone who has regrets. Sit with someone who's, you know, 60s, 70s, didn't pull the trigger on the things that they want and you see what the weight of regret really is. Now, sometimes the things that you fear 
You know, you just need a plan together and you just got to get out there and do them. Again, on five years growth. Five years growth in 12 months, not easy. It is not easy. But man, or 12 to 18 months, man, it is cool. Because you do the things you need to do. You push, you grow. When you get on to achieve things, you know, you do get some cool stuff along the way, down the track. But the coolest thing is the person you become in that process. And so I just wanted to use that as an opportunity to share um, for you to be able to go, if there's stuff you're stalling on, please don't stall on it moving out of today. You know, like if there's someone in your business you know you need to fire, do what you need to do. If there's a restructure you need to make, do that. If you need to hire someone to replace you or there's a plan to put in motion, do it. If you're spending too much money on stupid shit, stop. If you don't have a wealth creation plan, start one. If you're not training, start. If your relationship with your mum, your dad, your brother or your sister is not where you want it to be as you're in this room today, do me a favour because it's the, the single smallest thing coming out of this sesh. Give them a call. Give them a, give them a call. Just ring up and say, I love you. Miss ya. No, I haven't called too much, but I love ya. Let's catch up. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Pulling the trigger and doing the shit that you need to do. Get clear on, you know, don't hesitate to do a life audit. We all know what we want. You want to pull the trigger, put your COI on the mirror. Put your cost of inaction on the mirror. I realised when I was being a little shit in NZ, I was successful, you know, from the outside in, wasn't, wasn't that happy. But I realised my COI was like something happening to my parents and me not living the life that I wanted with them. 2021, beginning of 2021, sorry, beginning of 2022, dad's in hospital in Ballarat. He's at the peak of, you know, I guess the decrease of his health. And uh, in the five years that had gone before that, six years maybe, seven years actually, we'd been around Hawaii, we'd done Route 66 in California, we drank spice rum in his shed listening to Roy Orbison, he'd come with me when I got my Mustang, we'd done so many fantastic experiences. I'm holding my dad's hand in hospital in Ballarat and it's hard for me to say, we thought we were going to lose him. But he says, Tommy, mate, I love you. Like, if something happens, just know that I'm so proud. And that's hard. Like, it's hard for me to say because I went through five years where I was just a little shit, just chasing, chasing success, you know. That would have been way too big of a price to pay. Now, fortunately, dad's health has become good. He was in one of these sessions. Twice as hard to say when he's in the room. But his health's come good. But don't leave that. Don't leave that with mum. Don't leave that with your sister. I lost my best mate to cancer at age 42. And he had still had things on his to-do list that he wanted to do. You know, he still had things on his to-do list that he wanted to do. And so life's short. Get out there and, and go after it. Don't pay your cost of COI. You know, many times you're just living that worst case scenario. Get out there and go after it.